In this video, we will be exploring the different classes of oxidizers and the relative reactivities of oxidizers based on those classes. So just as a reminder, oxidizers are substances that do not burn themselves, or at least most of the time do not burn themselves, but are participants in the reaction in that they usually provide necessary resources, oxygen in particular, to a fire. And so as a result, we know that a lot of different kinds of fuels, um, and fuel is the common name that we use for the substance in a fire that is not the oxidizer. The fuel can be a variety of different things, um, lubricants, oils, fats, uh, different types of building materials, class A kinds of designation stuff, um, class B kinds of designation stuff uh, as well. Now, we use the word many here because that is not all-inclusive. There are, there are a couple of classes of oxidizers that are actually capable of igniting on their own. And what they do is they basically become self-igniting materials. Um, as they decompose, they heat up. As they heat up and decompose, they create oxygen and a flammable material. And the combination of the heat, the fuel, and the oxygen together can start a fire. But that's kind of a rare circumstance. Most are not flammable. Most provide oxygen in some kind of way. And so there are four different classes of oxidizers. The first class is weak. Weak oxidizers are ones that will slowly increase the burning rate. And so in here we have a, a number of common examples of oxidizers, things that we would find on a relatively regular basis. Um, hydrogen peroxide, for example. Now note, with hydrogen peroxide, we are shown a concentration value here. The concentration value says that hydrogen peroxide in the 8 to 27 percent range would be classified as a weak oxidizer. Um, and so this kind of material would be your commercial grade uh, hydrogen peroxide. Like what you would use for bleaching. Um, get this at a hair salon or something like that. The stuff that you get at the drugstore or at Walmart uh, that comes in the brown bottles, that's only about 3% hydrogen peroxide. So um, while it does a good job at oxidizing and, and using that oxidation power as a disinfectant, it's actually too weak to be considered an oxidizer according to these classes. Um, to get into the classes here, you have to get up into the 8% range. You have to get into a commercial grade um, kind of situation. And again, where you find this are things like hair salons, um, places that are selling you um, uh, hydrogen peroxide as a bleaching agent. Um, nitric acid. When nitric acid is below 70%, which is pretty much every kind of nitric acid that is not what we would call concentrated nitric acid uh, classifies as a weak oxidizer if you've ever had occasion to work with nitric acid and you accidentally get some of it on your hands it turns your hands yellow that's that oxidation going on what's happening is the nitric acid is reacting with your skin and you end up getting a discoloration as a result of the reaction between the nitrate ion um, and the, the, uh, the uh, components of your skin. Uh, ammonium nitrate, which is found in a number of different types of fertilizers, that is a weak oxidizer as well. Also in here are things like silver nitrate and sodium nitrite. Sodium nitrite, probably the most famous uh, pink salt, um, uh, commonly used as a preservative. Why? Well, um, the oxidizing power of that nitrite ion kills bacteria. Um, um, 
Now, we've found that nitrites have also nasty effects on our health, which is why we're supposed to avoid them, but that's what that is. Moving on to our second class. The second class of oxidizers are the moderate oxidizers. And again, we can see with our moderate oxidizers that we are talking about concentration values. So we've got a higher concentration of sodium, or excuse me, of uh, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, now we're in the 28 to 51 percent range. This is more of a laboratory grade hydrogen peroxide. Um, we also can see concentrated nitric acid in this class. Uh, we can also see um, uh, calcium hypochlorite. Um, otherwise known as uh, HTH. Um, and that is a substance that in lower concentrations, um, we can find it in this moderate class. What we'll see is that this will show up in higher concentrations in the next class. Also in here are potassium permanganate, which has a really dark purple kind of color. And then solid sodium peroxide. Um, falls into this class as well. Um, and so the difference between these is the, the strength and intensity uh, at which they work. Uh, moderate oxidizers are ones that are going to moderately increase the burning rate, uh, whereas the weak ones very slowly worked. Um, our third class are what we would call the strong oxidizers. Uh, once again, we can look and see, okay, the hydrogen peroxide is now um, in the 52 to 91 percent range. We're going above laboratory values now. Now we're getting into uh, commercial industrial kinds of applications of hydrogen peroxide. We're also seeing um, high concentration HTH, uh, calcium hypochlorite. We're also seeing the first appearance of some of our chlorate compounds. Um, perchloric acid in lower concentrations. Um, potassium chlorate and sodium chlorate. Uh, and both of these are very prominent in different kinds of industries related to fireworks, and explosives. Um, chlorates do a very, very good job of oxidizing. Um, and if you want something that's a little bit more controllable, um, chlorates are usually the way to go. So what makes them different? Uh, obviously we see an increase in the burning rate uh, compared to moderate. Um, and the other part here that wasn't present before is this idea of a self-sustained decomposition. So the other ones, you, know, you put them into contact with something that was burning and the, the burning of the object uh, caused them to um, give up more oxygen to help the, the reaction go. Here we see that when these substances are catalyzed or when they are heated, they'll start to decompose all on their own. And so they'll start generating oxygen in, in massive quantities. Um, there's a really, really cool experiment uh, I'll show you at the end here involving chlorates, um, where we can see the all you need to do is heat chlorates strongly and they will produce massive amounts of oxygen. And those massive amounts of oxygen can be used to generate uh, combustion reactions. So the last category here are explosives, uh, explosive oxidizers. These are substances that when they undergo explosive reaction, they can undergo explosive reactions when they are catalyzed, heated, or exposed to shock or friction. And so what we see here are, are really the bad boys. Um, we've got combinations of really, really high concentration um, hydrogen peroxide. So 
this application of hydrogen peroxide, this is what we usually would think of as rocket fuel. High, high concentrations of perchloric acid. Um, high, high, con uh, you know, now we're seeing chlorate ions mixed with ammonium ions. Ammonium ions are already prone to oxidation. Now we're throwing in another ion that's prone to oxidation, and we get something that's much more reactive and more dangerous. Same thing with the ammonium uh, per, per manganate here. So we got ammonium chlorate here. We've got ammonium per manganate here. And now we're looking at, okay, this is, this is really serious stuff. So, so we're going to end this video by looking at uh, one of the reactions uh, of one of those strong oxidizers. And so this is um, molten potassium chlorate. So um, uh, this video is actually from uh, C for Chemistry. Uh, I'll link uh, in the description for the original video. Um, but in this reaction, they're doing something called the gummy bear experiment. Um, and in this, we're going to take potassium chlorate, which we just identified as a strong oxidizer. We're going to heat it up, and then we're going to put something in it that's going to cause a combustion reaction to take place. So let's go ahead and, and um, just watch here. So this is pretty nasty stuff. So let's, you know, take this a little bit of caution here. This is not something that you want to do on your own if you have the materials. But you can see we're going to spoon in some potassium chlorate, um, just enough to kind of cover the bottom of that test tube there. And we're going to light our tear roll burner. And oh my goodness, he's lighting it with a lighter. That's so not the way to do it. Um, okay, he's moving it around so he's actually melting the potassium chlorate. And if you look closely, you can see bubbles kind of forming on the surface there. That's actually the oxygen gas that is forming as the potassium chlorate is decomposing. Now we put in the gummy bear, and the gummy bear explodes into this violent reaction. We get purple light because of uh, the potassium. If you remember from your flame test lab, the potassium ion gives off this whitish purple light when it's excited. And you just got this gummy bear incinerating inside of the test tube. And you can see now that the reaction has subsided, we've got a whole bunch of smoke. We've got a whole bunch of smoke here. Let's go back a couple seconds and we can see that the ashes are there. So gummy bears are pretty much essentially sugar, um, sugar and a little bit of uh, gelatin, um, but all of it more organic material. And so you're putting fuel, you're putting an organic substance inside of this oxygen rich environment that has a lot of heat. And so you combine heat, fuel and oxidizer together. That's your flame triangle. Uh, you're going to get a fire started in there, and it's very spectacular. I would encourage you to actually watch the video on YouTube. Um, the sound that is generated as this reaction proceeds is why this um, reaction is often referred to as the screaming gummy bear experiment. Uh, so until next time, have a good day.